Hey there, I'm Philip Molina, and on this channel, we analyze and dissect and have a lot of fun sharing as many little missable moments as we can in our favorite nerd properties. But get ready, because just like the trailer before it, Star Wars The Force Awakens, the movie, is insanely packed with references and Easter eggs and cameos and interesting imagery, and all sorts of trivia. And I'm just preparing you because this is gonna be a huge video, but totally worth it because there's so much cool stuff. And I definitely think we actually spotted a few things that. I haven't seen anywhere else. Oh, and obviously with the movie being so jam-packed, they had to cut a thing or two. But lucky for you, I've got a good idea on what those deleted scenes were, and I'll go over those too. Now, if you think I miss anything, feel free to let me know in the comments, but there's a good chance we already covered it in one of our other Star Wars references and Easter eggs videos for the trailer breakdown. So check those out after this if you want to see even more. All right, going in order as it played out in the movie, let's get to it. Spoilers galore, starting at the beginning. The opening shot of the film, which is up there as maybe one of the coolest looking ones they've ever done, shows us a new level of Star Destroyer eclipsing a planet. The Star Destroyer is called the Finalizer, and this epic ship is twice as big as the old school Star Destroyers, and it actually had to be built in secret because it really blatantly violates the treaty between the First Order and the New Republic. But since this epic shot is also the first thing we see, you might not be surprised that there's some interesting imagery choices going on here too. The tip of the Finalizer very much resembles resembles the cross guard of Kylo Ren's lightsaber and this ship with that cross guard style mask begins to block out all of the light in the shot, almost completely bringing darkness to the planet below. But when there's just the tiniest sliver of light left, a few ships shoot out of its side, escaping through the light, specifically including the ship that Finn is on. Cool, right? JJ did a lot of this kind of stuff in this movie. Moving on. In Star Wars, the language we hear our main character speak sounds a lot like English, yeah. but they call it basic. How are the first non-basic words of the movie are some concerned beeps from BB-8 when he sees the First Order approaching Jakku. But the first English or basic words that are spoken are by Max von Sydow's Lor Santeca, and his line is, this should begin to make things right. Th th that's the first line of the first Star Wars movie since the not loved prequels. So another translation of that might be like, damn, Shots fired, Lord Santeca and JJ. That's an unofficial translation though. Moving on. This is your company. When the troop transporters carrying Finn land on the sands of Jakku, their design and the choreography and the cinematography, they're all nods to the landing crafts touching down on the sands of Omaha Beach, specifically the way it was depicted in one of JJ's mentors movies, Saving Private Ryan, directed by Steven Spielberg. In both movies, we get shots of the concerned soldiers packed into the vessels and they can't see where they're about to land, but the most moment the vessel doors lowered, the soldiers up front are immediately killed. Chaos then ensues, and when Finn spaces out due to all the violence, it's almost identical to the way Tom Hanks spaces out, also not being able to comprehend it all. JJ's borrowing that movie's realistic depiction of invasion and the surrounding tragedy to make us right out of the gate realize these stormtroopers are actual people who are actually dying. And that's all before we've even seen one of them take their helmets off. Also, this isn't the only World War II reference in the movie, but that's later. Let's keep going. The X-Wing that Poe jumps into but is quickly disabled is actually not fancy new technology. It's more of a modified version of what the Rebels already had back in the original trilogy. And the point of this reference is to show us that the Resistance is not well funded. They are working off what is now very old technology. Meanwhile, the First Order moments later shows off their fancy brand new ships when Kylo Ren arrives in his personal Upsilon class shuttle. And it's twice as big and way newer than Vader's old Lambda class shuttle, and it's obviously like nine Greek letters better. A few moments later, we see one of the most memorable, amazing moments in the movie when Kylo Ren uses his force abilities to freeze a freaking blaster bolt midair. Considering blaster bolts are kind of like shooting lasers, that's something we've never seen the force do, manipulate light energy. The way the beam freezes, in uh, the way it looks, I mean, it's weird to say this, but it's actually scientifically accurate. And that's because I'm pretty sure the filmmakers studied this actual experiment and realized life where Star Wars obsessed scientists wanted to see what it would look like to freeze a blaster bolt mid-air. Also, this new manipulating of light that the Force can do, it's not our only new Force ability, but let's keep going. Now, it's well known that the legendary John Williams came back to compose the music for The Force Awakens, but that means that J.J. wasn't able to go to his go-to composer for everything from Alias to Star Trek, Michael Giacchino. That guy is totally great, too. He won the Oscar for his score for Up, and I can still hum like every score from Lost, but 
but Chikino actually considers John Williams to be his hero, and he even said he'd rather hear new Star Wars music from John Williams than from himself. He got rewarded because he's the stormtrooper that pushes Poe Dameron down in front of Kylo Ren, so it's a pretty good trade. A few moments later when BB-8 sees the explosion and he thinks Poe might be dead, his sounds are incredibly emotional and sad, and that makes sense considering actual humans performed BB-8's voice. You might already know that it was actually Bill Hader and John Ralphio himself, Ben Schwartz, and it really is their performance because what they did is they spoke words and made sounds into an iPad app that digitized their voices into robotic sound. Fun Bill Hader fact, he's actually a huge Star Wars nerd and like 10 years ago, he was begging to be a lowly production assistant on this Star Wars documentary just because he loved it so much. And I'm also not surprised that he got the job as BB-8's voice because a lot of people don't remember years ago, he used to go around doing these amazing impressions of non-human Star Wars characters. They're just so good. Watch. I could do Jabba the Hutt dying. <laughs> Yeah, I want to hear Dying Tauntaun, yeah, okay. Amazing. And for Ben Schwartz, uh, here's a video of another time that he added his voice to a part of Star Wars that doesn't really use words. Where are the Okay, then we meet Captain Phasma, who's our first Game of Thrones cameo, Gwendolyn Christie. And while you probably did know that, a lot of people don't know that her shiny armor, it's purposely made to stand out within the Star Wars universe because she wants it to be a symbol. In Star Wars history, it turns out it's actually melted down from one of those chromium ships that they use on the Emperor and Padme's homeworld, Naboo. And her armor specifically came from one of the Emperor's ships. So Phasma uses it as a symbol of his power. Then Ray scavenges and there's a specific moment where she pulls out a salvaged old Star Destroyer part. It's a capacitor bearing, but the framing of this shot is very purposely mirrored almost exactly in a much more climactic moment later in the movie when Rey is pulling out parts of the fancy new Starkiller base. And the way she repels around these old Destroyer walls, it's also mimicked in her escape from the new vessel's interrogation area. So it's just a bunch of setups and payoffs. Rey then takes her findings back on her speeder, and sure, it has some similarities to Luke's speeder, but it's actually hard to place what what kind of speeder it is. And that's because, as it turns out, Rey built it herself from other parts she scavenged. In fact, you might not have noticed, there's no seat. She's sitting on the engine. And the engine is a recycled pod racer engine. There's also other pod racer parts floating around on Jakku, and the tattered pod racer flags at Maz Kanata's castle, they all give us a detail that's pretty easy to miss. In this time of the Star Wars universe, no one pod races anymore. And I actually get that, because a silly spectator sport doesn't make as much sense once the Emperor takes over and every Everything's terrible. Can't say I miss it either, though. <laughs> And the, the movie doesn't have a ton of nods to the prequels, but there are some. Then we get another epically beautiful shot where Rey cruises past the outside of the Down Star Destroyer, and it's actually known to be the Inflictor. It was a destroyer that went down back in the Battle of Jakku, and it has a whole story about why it's crashed into that very spot in the sand. And if you want to know that story, it's in the new Star Wars book, Lost Stars. Uh, I'll put a link to the description to it. But what I think is coolest about this shot and a shot we get a little later where she's standing behind a Super Star Destroyer is that it's the first time we've actually been able to grasp the scale of these huge ships next to a human being. It finally gives us a relative size for all those shots that are in space, and holy crap, that means all of those battles are so massive. Ray then drags her scavenging jeans to Unker Plutt, who seems to run things here on Nima Outpost, and the actor underneath that blobbiness happens to be Simon Pegg. His voice was heavily altered, but he's actually really in there wearing all that stuff. Star Wars. I burned the Star Wars. Only his facial expressions were enhanced with CGI. Uh, it's also fun to note that Simon Pegg's one of the stars of the new Star Trek movies, and he's writing the new one, so I guess he can join Finn in the list of really likable traitors. When Rey goes home, we get a really good look at her belongings, including this little rebel pilot doll that she clearly made herself and would probably do really well if she sold it on Etsy, but she clearly has a thing about rebel pilots. Later, she's outside of her home, which is a downed ATAT -AT, or at-at if you 
you say it that way. I'll let you guys debate that in the comments. But anyway, when she goes out there, she puts on an old Rebel flight helmet. And as she imagines what it would be like to be a Rebel pilot, you can see on the side the Star Wars Arabesh letters, Resh, Enf, and Herf, which in English spell R-A-E-H, as in Ray. Now that's not just some cute production designer joke though. The helmet's markings actually mean it belongs to the Tyrfin Yellow Aces, specifically Captain Dosmet Ray, a female X-Wing pilot. So here's my theory. Considering how obsessed Ray is with this pilot and her adventures, and how little she seems to know about her own past, couldn't it be the case that Ray actually named herself after Captain Ray, like having forgotten her own original name? It would mirror how Kylo Ren chose to go by a new name when he changed his identities. Kylo Ren is actually Ben, then Ray could be Bay. Bay Skywalker, <laughs> or Bay Kenobi, that's terrible. No, uh, forget the Bay part. The theory kind of holds up. No bay. Moving on. Ray rescues BB-8 from Tito's net, and I'm pretty sure that's the moment where a Star Wars character says Jub-Jub. I think Tito mutters it right there. If you don't know, by the way, Jub-Jub is this trademark phrase of Conan O'Brien's. It means nothing. He just loves it. He put it in The Simpsons. It was the iguana. Jub-Jub is fantastic. And he begged JJ to put it in Star Wars. And you got Jub-Jub in. I did. This is fantastic. I'm pretty sure that's where it is. And speaking of trademark phrases, when Ray tells BB-8 to stay off Kelvin Ridge, it's a reference to J.J. Abrams' grandfather, Henry Kelvin. He actually puts that in all of his projects. It was big and lost, it's a major ship in Star Trek, so now you can add Kelvin Ridge to that list. Back on the finalizer, Poe, played by Oscar Isaac, being forced, tortured, and interrogated by Kylo Ren, and just outside the room is General Hux, played by Donald Gleason. Now a lot of people like to point out that Isaacs and Gleason were in a movie together about a very advanced droid called Ex Machina. And that movie's great, actually. But I don't think it's nearly as fun as reminding people that Kylo and Poe were in a movie together, too. That scene is equally intense. Back on Jakku, the only quick thing worth pointing out is that Unker Plot refers to BB-8 as a him. And then throughout the entire rest of the movie, people call BB-8 a him. And that might not seem unusual, except almost all the way up until the film's release, BB-8 was confirmed to be a girl. That's because Lucasfilm's president, Kathleen Kennedy, referred to her as a girl, and so did the designers of BB-8. So why do people keep calling it a him? They don't give us much of an answer, actually. They just say that somewhere in the design changes, they changed something about BB-8 that made him definitively a boy. And like, the only thing I can think is that somewhere along the line, they added a wiener. Like, I, I don't know how else they it would be able to just suddenly shift genders. Thinking about it, I guess they wouldn't really want to have to explain why to do dudes were hired to do the voice of a female droid. That sounds way more plausible actually than the adding a wiener. <laughs> it just it just wouldn't be practical. You can't, you wouldn't be able to roll with it. Let's move on. <laughs> on the finalizer, we see Finn take off his Stormtrooper helmet and reveal to Poe that he's rescuing him. And it's a direct reference to Luke's revealing to Leia in A New Hope. I'm Luke Skywalker, I'm here to rescue you. Then as Finn and Poe try and make their escape, we get our best look at Petty Officer Thanison. He's actually Game of Thrones cameo number two, Thomas Brody Sangster. You might better remember him as the adorably horny little kid from Love Actually. Uh, unfortunately, if you're a big fan of his, that's all you get, because he dies like 10 seconds later. In that same escape scene, you actually also hear the infamous Wilhelm scream <laughs> that's in every Star Wars movie. <laughs> Poe and Finn escape on the TIE Fighters, and the finalizer fires the ventral cannons. We see some really unusual blasts rather than the lasers we're used to. I mean, one of those things takes out the whole side of the TIE Fighter. And the thing is, this could be part of this huge reveal in the way the First Order works now. Apparently, the new Star Destroyer, the Finalizer, it has a brand new weapon that is very expensive and very special because it's powered by kyber crystals. And why does that matter? Kyber crystals are what Jedi's use to make lightsabers. The bad guy Sith sabers are usually made using these knockoff synthetic crystals, but not the Jedi's, and actually not Kylo Ren's saber either. But the fact that the First Order is now using weapons powered by kyber crystals tells us that the First Order is actually using technology powered by the Force. So that means Snoke is intermingling the First Order and the Dark Side way more than the original Empire ever did, which is gonna make a huge difference when the First Order is trying to take on Jedi. Also, while Finn and Poe are escaping, we get the reveal that Finn doesn't actually have a name, but rather he's referred to by his number, FN2187. Now, there's one kind of obvious reference there, because Cell 2187 is where they found Princess Leia way back on the Death Star. Here it is. 
2187. You go and get her. But the number 2187 is itself a bigger what? reference to the 1963 short film 2187 directed by Arthur Lipset. It's one of those super artsy short films. It's like all in black and white, but it completely inspired George Lucas in his making of Star Wars. Like I'm talking droids and the force and it's just so much stuff. I would have to save it for another video, but I will point out the way that they use the numbers in 2187. Like these are some of the last words in the short film. Somebody walks up and you say, your number is 2187, isn't it? So not that references would ever be in competition with each other, but isn't it cool that sure in the original, it was Leia's cell on the Death Star, but here in this 2187 is exactly how people refer to Finn. And that's also the way they use it in the short film. They walk up to him and call him number 2187. Very cool reference, moving on. When Phasma reports back about FN 2187 going rogue, you can see young Finn, maybe around eight or nine years old, and probably the age he was when he was taken by the first order. Then as General Hux and Kylo Ren bicker like siblings, Ren says that perhaps Snoke should have used a clone army. It's obviously a reference to the past days of the clone troopers based on Jango Fett, but it's also really interesting because it's reinforcing stormtroopers are real people, but it actually is opening up another really interesting possibility. They might not all be human. Finn's the only one we've seen take his helmet off. Speaking of Finn, he and Rey finally meet and it's very fun and she doesn't need hand holding. Are you okay? Yeah, follow me. And the two of them and BB-8 run through this archway that marks the entrance to Nima Outpost. And it's actually a design that we never got to see, but was supposed to mark the entrance to Jabba the Hutt's palace way back in Return of the Jedi. It, it actually makes a lot of sense here though, since Nima Outpost was named for Nima the Hutt, a lady hut. And thank God we didn't have to see her. Also at this exact same part, the camera actually pans right past the Millennium Falcon. Most people just didn't notice it. Oh, and of course, Rey calling it garbage is a callback to Luke calling it a piece of junk, which might seem harsh since Rey collects junk for a living, but the Falcon actually is a really old freighter ship now. You can actually see it at one point flying around in the prequels, and that's more than 50 years before the events of this movie. But at least she's got it where it counts. Its latest owner is revealed to be Ungar Plutt. You hear him yell, that's mine. Uh, when Ray Grand Theft Auto's it. And this is a really good moment to reveal another scene that was deleted. Apparently, Ankar actually tracks the Falcon to Takodana and Maz Kanata's castle. He then gets in a fight with our heroes, and finally, something that's been teased at before, but we've never seen, Chewie tears his freaking arm off. That's not wise, I've said a Wookiee. That's amazing. I totally hope they shot it and it makes its way onto a Blu-ray or something, because I gotta see that Wookiee yank. That's not what I mean. Back to the chase scene. Uh, we can see how the Falcon has held up and it's not well at all, actually. You can see the gunner seat that Finn's operating is really rough and clunky. And, and in another parallel to A New Hope, it's actually shot very similarly to Han and Luke's escape flight on the Falcon. They even celebrate the same way. <laughs> The targeting computer is still the exact same Nintendo Virtual Boy game. But we do see one clear upgrade that somebody made. There's a new antenna on top of it. Because if you remember when Lando told Han that he's going to return the Falcon without a scratch, he almost immediately gets the antenna smashed off the top. This new little antenna is rectangular instead of round. And I guess the advantage there is that parents can't just recycle the old toy. They have to get the new one with the rectangle for their bad parents. <laughs> As Rey pilots the Falcon, Get ready! She flies through the hull of one of the old crashed starships, which is even bigger than the massive inflictor we saw earlier. And this is a Super Star Destroyer. It's actually what's left of the Ravager that also went down in the Battle of Jakku. It was actually the last Super Star Destroyer the original Empire had, and the Admiral in charge of that ship, her name was also Rey. There's a lot of Rays in this neighborhood. Uh, the story of that ship is in the Star Wars book Aftermath, not Lost Stars. Uh, I'll link to that one in the description too. Moving on. After Rey and Finn escape, the Falcon gets pulled into Han and Chewie's new cargo ship, the Aravana. And it's gonna be a really long time before anyone can definitely see it clearly if it's there. But apparently there's a cargo container on this ship that is numbered 9906753. That's the same number we saw on a different cargo crate in Hangar 51 in Indiana Jones. And in there, it contains the Ark of the Covenant. It's like Harrison Ford cannot get away from that thing. When Han and Chewie board the Million Falcon, we get a ton of quick nods to the original trilogy, Ray and Finn hiding out in the smuggling compartment that Luke, Han, and Obi-Wan hid in before. Uh, they're also wearing the same atmospheric mask that Han, Chewie, and Leia wear in Empire Strikes Back. And that scene back then, they're out there cleaning off Minoc bats who have that gross sucker mouth that is on the glass of the Falcon and also the Rathar mouth and tentacles on the Falcon's cockpit glass. 
And also Ray references that Falcon famous show-off statistic about its Kessel Run distance, but she gets it wrong. It says it's 14 parsecs and a million nerds shout 12 at the same time that Han does. And oh my god, that is a lot of references. Oh, you want more? Okay. <gasps> In that same sequence, we get cameos from the really badass stars of the raid as members of Kanji Club. And seriously, they are epic fighters. You should watch the raid to see that. Uh, we also get Han saying, I have a bad feeling about this. And it's the third time Han has said that. I got a bad feeling about this. A really bad feeling about this. Which means he surpasses Obi-Wan as the person that said it the most, though he already had that record if you count the time that Indiana Jones said it in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I got a bad feeling about this. Oh, and the Indiana Jones references go the other direction when they're all trying to outrun the Rathars. As one of them comes rolling behind Han, it's exactly the same framing as the famous boulder that's chasing Indy in Raiders of the Last Ark. And when Finn is looking for gods, he finds and tosses Luke's training remote droid thing. And it's actually technically Han's remote, but that doesn't matter because the references are done. And oh my God, when they are on the Falcon, it's like nonstop references. <sighs> but luckily the movie takes us to Starkiller Base. There we get our first good look at Supreme Leader Snoke, albeit he's just a giant hologram. Snoke is rumored to actually only be seven feet tall only, but here it's probably just a reference to the giant hologram of the Emperors in Empire Strikes Back. But did you see that huge crater in Snoke's head? There's obviously a lot about his backstory that we don't know. Moving on, we get back to the Falcon, which means more references. Finn accidentally activates the hollow chess game, but what's actually really cool about that moment is that it picks up right after where the game left off in A New Hope. The little guy that just got body slammed, he stands back up and he smacks the opponent over the head with a mallet and just good for the little guy. The other really cool thing about the game is that they actually went and shot new stop motion animation just like the way they did it in the original. Then our crew arrives to Maz's pirate castle on Takodana and inside that castle there's a ton of other references and easter eggs. In fact, I bet there's gonna be so many more revealed over time, but here's what I've got so far. The song you hear when you enter was written and performed by Broadway's Lin-Manuel Miranda and J.J. Abrams himself. There's also a funny little alien who's played by Warwick Davis. And Warwick played Wicket the Ewok in Return of the Jedi. He also played two characters in Phantom Menace. It was uh, Wald and Weasel. And the W names continue because this alien's name is Wallavin. It's a great name. Name your kids that. There's also a couple of droids that are among the oldest ones we've ever seen in Star Wars. One of which, ME-89, kind of looks like an ancient ancestor to C-3PO. He's actually rumored to be like thousands of years old, so these might be some of the first droids ever. But onto my favorite cameo that we see in the castle, and it's right when we walk in, the camera purposely stays with this little creature guy for some extra time, and he looks a lot like some sort of wolf man. That's a really slick reference to the original New Hope, as in Star Wars as it was in 1977, the non-special editions. You see, back in 1997, there were the Star Wars special editions, and they did it again in 2004 and in 2011. George Lucas just kept going back to the original trilogy and updating the effects and changing a bunch of scenes and adding a bunch of CGI. And that's why somehow Hayden Christensen is in a movie that was released in 1983 and how Han went from shooting Greedo first to shooting in self-defense. So for the most part, this is the moment when people started to really hate on George Lucas and his unnecessary CGI update. One of the mascots of the anti-special edition movement was the original Moss Eisley Cantina Wolfman. And now most people watching this video right now, I've probably never even seen this guy. And that's because Lucasfilms has done everything possible it can to erase him and any reference to him from existence. They replaced him with two different aliens in the original movie. But JJ here is very subtly sharing how he feels about those special editions changes. He makes it super clear he thinks the practical Wolfman belongs in a cantina scene. He reinforces that practical effects preference when you realize, aside from Maz Kanata herself, every character in this entire scene is a practical, as a non-CG, character. And to really point that out, this scene actually opens with an almost minute long single take uncut shot showing us all of them. Really cool. Oh, and after that uncut tracking shot, we get our quick Judah Friedlander cameo. And he's also not CGI. He's just Judah Friedlander in space. Now, all this stuff in Maz Kanata is clearly obviously just packed with references, but it makes you wonder what stuff we didn't see. Because as it turns out, this is another sequence that had a ton cut out of it. One of the deleted scenes has Ray gaining some 
extra wisdom from this priest-like figure. His name Proster Omlin, but he was totally cut out of the movie. Uh, but even more drastic, Maz herself had this entire storyline that was also completely cut out. And it's because JJ realized that ultimately, even if she continued on with our heroes, she didn't actually need to be there with them. So, yoink, he cut the whole thing out. Uh, you can actually see a remnant of Maz's storyline in that one shot from the trailers where she's handing Luke's lightsaber to Leia instead of Finn. Oh, and as for deleted Leia scenes, yeah, there were major deletions, but we will get back to that. One of the most talked about scenes is Rey's force vision, and that makes total sense because there's a lot going on there. You can actually hear Vader's breathing, not just at the beginning of the vision, but there are hints of it before she's even got into that room with the lightsaber. And then once the vision starts, added to the breathing is Luke screaming no when he finds out that Vader's his dad. No! And that all goes with the location that Rey is seen because that's the exact place on Cloud City where Luke and Vader had their epic fight. Then just before we see all the Knights of Ren, we see Kylo stab someone through the chest with his saber. But if you watch it closely, it almost seems like that person might have been about to attack someone. So there's a slight chance that Ren was actually saving someone with that attack. Let me know what you think about that when you rewatch that scene. Up next in the vision, a large figure pulls young Rey away and that bulbous hand and that deep voice voice saying, quiet girl. It all seems to be very likely Unkar Plus. So that could mean that he's actually not such a bad guy or that whoever left her with him just didn't know what a jerk he'd be. Then right at the end of the vision, if you keep your ears open, you hear both a young and old Obi-Wan with Alec Guinness's voice saying, Ray, and Ewan McGregor saying, these are the first steps. That's so awesome. They had Ewan come in and record new lines just for that. But with the late Alec Guinness, they used this moment from Obi-Wan saying, afraid. Don't be afraid. And they chopped it down so that Sir Alec could say, Ray? Very cool, and one of my favorite things they did, it was just so worth hearing his voice again. Now also, somewhere else in there, you're supposed to be able to hear Yoda's voice saying, It's energy. Surround us. And bind us. But for the life of me, I've seen the movie like four times now. I have not been able to make it out. Let me know in the comments if you hear it and exactly where it is. Oh, and about this whole psychic vision thing that's happening here with Rey, that's all a very specific but new to the movie's Jedi power called psychometry, where touching an object allows a force user to see visions of the object's memories and also just to tap into the past and future. And it's a really big deal in Star Wars, actually. And that's because almost no one has ever had that power. So it lends credence to Rey being a very special type of Jedi. Also really interesting to note is that the few Jedis that have had that power were banned from using it because being able to see through the eyes of others and witness extreme violence, you guessed it, Jedis believe that lets the dark side in. So potential storyline for Rey in the future? Maybe? I don't know. Okay, up next we have this very crazy, angry General Hux speech. And this section after the opening Stormtrooper scene, it's our other major World War II reference. This whole thing is very closely modeled after the speeches of Adolf Hitler, not just the screaming and the uniforms, but the body language, the colors, the troop formations, and really blatantly, the stormtroopers' arms shooting up Heiling Hux. Nazis have actually always been the main inspiration for the Empire, and Hitler's rise to power is very similar to the way the Emperor did it. Force Awakens actually picks up where that left off, because after World War II, many Nazis went into hiding in Argentina. And that's almost exactly what happens after the Empire is shattered. Their remnants also go into hiding in Argentina. No, I'm kidding. Uh, in the unknown region of the galaxy where they could all go be evil and the New Republic wouldn't notice. Also, the way the First Order takes young children and then they basically brainwash them into believing all their stupid nonsense and then they turn them into stormtroopers. That all is all pretty much exactly what the Nazis did with the Hitler Youth. But enough Nazis, okay? Uh, let's talk about what happens after the speech. They use Starkiller base to destroy the Hosnian system, including Hosnian Prime, which is the capital of the New Republic. And since we've seen how it works, that's the first time that a star has been utilized in an act of war in a Star Wars movie. And it's called the Hosnian system as a reference to the famed Los Angeles high school teacher Jim Hosney, who taught film to like everybody in Hollywood when they were teens, including all of J.J. Abrams' regular producing partners. Brian Burke, who produced this movie, Roberto Orci, and Alex Kurtzman, who co-produced the Star Trek movies with J.J. Hosney even taught the son of Lawrence Kasdan, who co-wrote this movie and Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back. So I guess all these people just felt like they owed this old high school teacher something, so they named an entire star system after him.
and then they blew it up, actually. <laughs> but anyway, back to the destroyed New Republic capital, we actually only get this really brief shot of it before it's blown up, except that one shot is a remnant of another huge storyline that was totally cut out of the movie, and it's the big Leia storyline that I alluded to earlier. So in that one shot of Hosnian Prime, the camera focuses on this girl that you might have wondered, is she important? Did we see her before? Well, she used to be important. That's Corsella, and I'm, I'm gonna save a lot of these smaller details for another video, but basically, in the time that's passed since Return of the Jedi, the New Republic really desperately wanted to pretend that everything was fine. They wanted to ignore everything the First Order was doing, even though it was breaking all these treaties that they had established. Princess Leia originally was seen as this kind of hero, but when she kept pointing out how stupid it was to ignore the First Order, everyone in the Senate kind of started to hate her, and they definitely stopped trusting her. So that's why Leia formed the Resistance separate from the New Republic, and there was a whole storyline in the movie that explained all that. In it, now General Leia feels that she finally has enough proof to the New Republic to act and send their fleet to take out the First Order or arrest them or do something because they know that they're building this insane weapon. But since she knows that no one in the New Republic trusts her anymore, she has to send one of her commanders, Corsella, to meet with the New Republic Senate to convince them to prepare for war or do like anything at all. And yeah, all of this stuff was cut for time. And there were also scenes in it where we learned that C-3PO is in charge of these droids that spy on the First Order. Leia gives a passionate speech to her troops. There's all kinds of characters and leaders of Naboo, a whole new chancellor, and it's all gone. We do, however, know how the storyline ends because we see the killer sunbeam hit Hosnian Prime and there's Corsella screaming and she's standing next to the new chancellor and yeah, poof, they're, they're dead. <laughs> if you thought the movie was missing a bit of the maybe politics of the New Republic or Leia being a really badass general, keep your fingers crossed for the deleted scenes because I think that's all in there. Okay, so then later when the First Order attacks Maz's castle, Han uses Chewie's bowcaster, and even though he actually used it a little earlier in the movie, we find out that these two times are the only times Han has ever used Chewie's signature weapon. And then when he sees that it can blow a freaking stormtrooper across the battlefield, of course, yeah, he's a big fan of it now. <laughs> later when the stormtroopers surround Chewie and Han and have them put their hands up, it's all a callback to the moment in Return of the Jedi where the same thing happens, except here the Resistance comes to the rescue, and back then it was a bunch of teddy bears or Ewoks. Oh, and in this epic rescue sneak attack, we get a moment where Finn watches Poe flying and says, that's one hell of a pilot. And yeah, he is. Because in that 20 second uncut shot, Poe takes out 10 TIE fighters and three stormtroopers. If you've ever heard of the concept of an ace pilot, that's defined as a pilot who has shot down at least five enemy planes over the course of their career. So that means Poe is a double ace pilot in just these 20 seconds. Yeah, he's definitely one of the best pilots ever. And considering the gift that that Luke gave his family in the comic book Shattered Empire, there's a chance that there's actually some force at work in Poe. Link to that story in the description too. And then when we finally do get Leia in this movie, uh, she arrives in a modified version of a B-Wing from Return of the Jedi. And it's actually another ship that's not like a new version. It's been cobbled together from parts left over from the original trilogy. And it really underlines that the Resistance doesn't have nice anything. Like all of their stuff is left over from the Galactic Civil War. Even their leaders. Then right after she lands, we get this really easy to miss cameo. Right before Han and Leia even talk, we see what seems like a standard protocol droid, but if you look closely, it's actually C-3PO. Of course, you probably didn't recognize them because of the red arm. Okay, no, I'm, t I'm kidding. Yes, I know you recognize them. But did you know that the red arm is going to get its own story in another part of the saga? It apparently has to do with a sacrifice that another droid made, and talking about it makes C-3PO very sad. And it kind of feels like 3PO got like really close to another droid while R2 was asleep. And I mean, sure, good for him. It is legal now. <laughs> anyway, once the gang goes over to the Secret Resistance base back on Dakar, we get a few more cameos, including Carrie Fisher's daughter, Billy Lord, Ken Lung from Lost, and JJ's own good luck charm, Greg Grunberg, who's in pretty much everything JJ does. He uh, even snuck him in as Kirk's stepdad in Star Trek. That car's an antique, but whip your ass. But here he's Snap Wexley, a grown up version of Temin Wexley from that Star Wars Aftermath book. The most interesting thing there is that in the book, it doesn't come out and say it, but it leaves 
you with the feeling that he could have some of the force in him. So let's just keep an eye on Snap as the movies keep coming out. Oh, and that doctor who is like hardcore flirting with Chewie, she's like calling him all brave and stuff. She's Lady Shackleton from Downton Abbey. But more interesting, she's the niece of Christopher Lee who played Count Dooku. Now she's Chewie's girlfriend, which is just asking for trouble with Maz. Also, the Resistance base here looks almost identical to the Rebel bases in the past. And it's like, oh God, the Resistance just needs some new funding. Then when Han and Leia are talking about their son who has been seduced by the dark side, she says, there is still light in him, I know, which is almost an exact quote of her mama Padme saying about Anakin, there's good in him. I know this. You can count them both as references to Luke saying about Vader, there is still good in him. And it's interesting that Luke and Padme are saying it to Obi-Wan and here Leia's saying it to Han. It's kind of like the Obi-Wan of this movie. Then after Kylo has kidnapped Rey and force infiltrates her mind, it's worth pointing out that he sees her dreams of a place that has a vast ocean and an island, which exactly describes where Rey finds Luke at the end of the movie. Also interesting, despite Kylo being the ultimate fanboy, it's actually Rey who brings up Darth Vader and she's the only person to mention that name in this movie. His presence is definitely everywhere though. And his presence. And this is a round where Rey famously pulls a Jedi mind trick on a stormtrooper, and it's actually only the fifth time we've seen that work in the seven movies so far. And the stormtrooper just so happens to be played by Daniel Craig. I'll say his voice sounds super American actually, so it's a pretty easy miss, but his character's name is a little less subtle. It's JB007. Back on Dakar, the Resistance starts their plan to attack Starkiller base, and we get lots of glimpses at all the characters whose scenes were cut out. Sorry to them. But we also get reintroduced to little Nyan and Numb, <laughs> who last co-piloted the Falcon with Lando. We also get everybody's favorite mollusk, Admiral Akbar. And while it was really awesome to see him, I cannot believe that they didn't have Akbar come running out when R2 and BB-8 put their star charts together and have him yelling, it's a map! Missed opportunity, if you ask me. Back over on Starkiller Base after Rey has escaped, we get a nice little tour of the facilities. And it's just interesting to note how you can see lots of places where the mechanical structures give way to natural rock formations in the hulls. And it really helps illustrate that Starkiller Base is not just some man-made weapon. It's actually carved out of the rock of this already existing icy world. We just never learned the planet's original name. After the Falcon gets through the shields and lands on Starkiller Base, there was another deleted scene that has snow troopers searching the Falcon, but you do get to see those snow troopers for like literally less than three seconds on the base, and their costumes are exactly the same designs that were meant to be used way back on Hoth and Empire, but they didn't end up getting used until now. Then we find out that Finn is a janitor, and that's not just a good setup for why Finn knows about the trash compactor, it actually answers a big question posed in the famous nerd analysis movie Clerks. I think the average stormtrooper knows how to install a toilet main? All they know is killing in white uniforms. And now we know, yeah, actually, stormtroopers have low-level, non-war-related specialties like sanitation. Side note, the director of Clerks is Kevin Smith and he's a huge Star Wars nerd and he's got a voice credit in The Force Awakens somewhere. I just have not been able to find it. Let me know if you know where it is. Up above in the aerial attack on Starkiller Base, we get some great shots of Resistance pilot Elo Atsi and that's a reference to Hello Nasty, the Beastie Boys album that JJ's a big fan of. It has Intergalactic on it, which is a really good fit, better than the Sabotage song used in Star Trek. His helmet also says in our best, Born to Ill, which is a combination of the Born to Kill helmet from Full Metal Jacket and Licensed to Ill, the first Beastie Boys studio album. And damn, JJ like loves the Beastie Boys. And another Resistance pilot, Jess Pava, is actually introduced in the book, The Weapon of a Jedi, where she's like super into Luke, link below. But the actress, Jessica Henwick, she marks our third Game of Thrones cameo. You might remember her as one of the Sand Snakes from Dorne, who's like really into whips. Also, when you rewatch this sequence after Chewie has told Han that he's cold, pay extra attention to Han and Finn's jackets. It's very subtle, but Chewie makes sure that even though he's cold, his old friend Han gets his jacket back. And at some point it seems like Finn has learned from this because he's given his new friend Rey his jacket. And this ever-changing jacket thing, it's just a nice way to show the growing relationship between Finn and Rey as it compares to Han and Chewie's. But it's actually probably something that we see a lot more of in another deleted scene. In this one, Han and Chewie have gone to set the charges for the 
bombs, but Ray and Finn have to go to a different part of the base to give Han and Chewie access. And in order to get there quickly, Ray and Finn steal another vehicle. They take out some snowtroopers, and Ray shows off more of her piloting of their snow speeder. And you can actually still see the snow speeder in the background just before they run back into the base. Another interesting choice in JJ's imagery is less subtle than the opening shots, but it's still pretty cool when Han's talking to Kylo and the light on Kylo's face changes from light to darkness, and then his entire face gets cast in red light, like the Sith color, just as his descent into the dark side is complete. It might not be the most subtle imagery, but it's just straight up a cool way to tell us information without having to explain it just literally with dialogue. Also, in this moment where, uh, spoiler, 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 how are you still watching this if you care about spoilers? The moment where Han dies, you'll note that Rey and Finn have to watch their mentor type be struck down by a lightsaber, and it all just mirrors pretty exactly Luke watching Vader kill Obi-Wan. No! And also, again, it makes Han this movie's Obi-Wan. Then Han's body falls down into the void, and it's reminiscent of a bunch of other Star Wars falling deaths, including Darth Maul, Mace Windu, Boba Fett, the Emperor. It's kind of similar to Luke falling in Empire Strikes Back, mostly similar to the Emperor and Darth Maul. Uh, except that, you know, Darth Maul didn't actually die then. Very crazy for another time. Point is, lots of falling. They gotta start having safety nets or something. Okay, moving on. Then Finn and eventually Rey have some pretty badass duels with Kylo out in the snow. And man, by the way, lightsabers at night melting the snow. That was all very cool. But also cool is the fighting style that they're using. It's actually lifted from the original trilogy, despite modern technology being able to recreate all the flips and parkour and fancy stuff they did in the prequels. It actually makes sense that in both the original trilogy and now in Force Awakens, no Jedis have actually gotten the level of training that allows for all those fancy moves. Even Luke never gets that great at handstands. So in their universe, it does make a lot of sense that this is a battle of mostly brute force and a jabbing style of attack. The prequel fighting style just hasn't been taught in a long time. Also another reference, despite being hurt, Kylo's actually trying a very cocky one-handed style of fighting. He's mimicking Darth Vader's form when he was toying with Luke. That cockiness just doesn't work out quite as well for Kylo. And moments later when the lightsaber is stuck in the snow and Rey force yanks it out, it's a lot like how Luke did it in the beginning of of Empire, but there's a much more interesting reference going on here to a very old but very legendary tale that actually inspires a lot of this entire movie. But since we're almost done, I'm just gonna point out very quickly some of the last Easter eggs and references before I go into that. They include a trench run, much like the one in A New Hope, but just for a moment where Poe's flying in the trench of Starkiller Base. And after the win in the celebration back on Dakar, but just before you see Leia flying solo, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see see just a little glimpse of R2-KT, a pink version of R2-D2 that was created by Star Wars fan Albin Johnson as a tribute to his daughter Katie, who unfortunately died back in 2005. But by putting the droid in this movie, she now has a legacy as big as Star Wars. And then the star map that BB-8 and R2-D2 put together is actually a very specific style of map. It existed in Knights of the Old Republic. These maps are very special. They're very old. They chart many systems that there's no other record of. And these maps might even have connections to the force itself. So they're really fancy maps. Finally, the last basic language words of the film are, may the force be with you, but the actual final lines of the film, just like the first ones, are a series of beeps and whistles. Except instead of BB-8, they're from R2-D2. But okay, returning to the huge reference that is going on throughout the entire movie, let's go back to that battle in the snow that Rey had had a vision of before. This entire story of hers and Kylo Ren's is very reminiscent to the tales of King Arthur. The Force Awakens Awakens actually gives us all sorts of little references to that time period. Remember when Kylo Ren's lightsaber was first unveiled, there was all that attention paid to the cross guard? That's because that's something we'd never seen in a lightsaber before, but it's very common in medieval broadswords. Also, Kylo's appearance is similar to that of King Arthur's nemesis, Mordred. The shaggy hair, the dark clothes. It's actually a look that's seen a lot in medieval warden-type characters, kind of like Jon Snow is, or uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham. Also, some other uniquely 
medieval references include a castle that's covered in old banners, stormtroopers using shields, Kylo's men being referred to as knights, the Knights of Ren. They even feel like the Knights of the Round Table that surround King Arthur, except they think Kylo's Arthur and they're wrong. Oh, and one of his other soldier types wears the metallic armor of a knight. But back to being mistaken about him, Mordred isn't the chosen one and neither is Kylo. Just like in King Arthur's origin, the chosen one is actually the young, poor orphan type. Still, Kylo thinks the lightsaber or sword is his birthright, especially because there's an evil practitioner of dark magic, Snoke, or Morgan Le Fay in Arthur's stories, misleading him. But when the sword slash saber is placed in stone, or in this case, snow, the one who thinks it's his birthright can't get it out. And instead, the sword will only go to the true chosen one, a young Arthur, or in our case, Rey. Now, pulling the sword out of the stone meant Arthur was destined to become king, so we'll see what that means for Rey. But it's also worth noting that in a lot of those Arthurian stories, a lot of versions of it, Mordred and Arthur are related. So that could be a clue to Rey and Ren's relationship. It's also worth noting that a lot of people have used this same comparison to describe the original trilogy with Luke and Vader and those roles and the Emperor as the Morgan Le Fay type. And actually, I'll say that even if that's the case, it all still works because if you say Luke is actually King Arthur, well, in those stories, when Arthur is gravely hurt, his mythical sword Excalibur is sent flying into the hands of the old and wise Lady of the Lake. She holds the sword for safekeeping until it's either needed again or until Arthur's time to return. Well, if Maz is our Lady of the Lake, she not only sees that the sword is needed again, giving it to Rey, but it also makes its way back to the original King Arthur to mark his return when Rey hands it to Luke. Oh, also, remember where Maz's castle is? Yeah, she lives on a lake. Okay, that was fun, and holy crap, so many freaking observations and references though. Actually, what the hell, one more quick observation. Right at the end, when we see Luke, before Rey has interrupted him and before he looks away, it looks like he's looking at a gravestone. A lot of theories, right? Uh, you, you tell me what you think that could be about uh, in the comments, and let me know anything else you think I might have missed. I did leave out some things that I didn't find too interesting, but some other stuff is in those other trailer breakdown videos that I mentioned, so check Check those out or any other videos that you might interest you there's a lot of them but if you like this video make sure to share it i think there's some really good stuff here it's a, it's a good share um i've been phil molina you can follow me on twitter at fimo and follow this channel for video updates at new rockstars subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this in your feed regularly because this is what i live for and this is what we make as for me i'm just gonna go see star wars again i know there's stuff that i'm still missing and i i'm just so mad i haven't heard the yoda line clearly i gotta go <laughs> Bye.